Of all the creatures I would choose to pull my chariot, two cats are probably last on the list. Hey, what's up? Welcome to Fantasy Art Reviews. Personally, I am extremely sick of the real world right now, so I am going to be escaping into an alternate one. And the world that I'm going to be enjoying for a little while is this one. It's a painting called Freya Seeking Her Husband from 1852. Before I talk about that, I hope that you'll hit the subscribe button and the bell. Also, liking and commenting helps the algorithm, so that helps me. Okay, like I said, this painting is called Freya Seeking Her Husband. It's from 1852. It's made by an artist named Niels Blomer. Or Blomer, I'm not exactly sure. He's a Swedish artist. This is a painting of the goddess Freya, and that's why I'm doing this for Thor's Day. It's a Norse goddess. I could do this on Friday because Freya is the origin of the name Friday. It's Freya's day. That's where we get Friday from. But I'm not. I'm going to be doing it on Thursday because that's my Thor's Day's videos about Norse stuff. Before I analyze and review this painting, I just want to, like I said, I really just want to enjoy it. Most of all, I really just want to enjoy how this figure is painted. The realism here is just really excellent. It's really nice. I really love the kind of golden light that's all over and her hair looks really good. I really like this sort of mist in the background here that gets darker towards the bottom. That's nice. Now, personally, flying kids all around is not something that is not a subject that I really enjoy. It's not something that I am drawn to, but I understand that that's a huge part of the history of western art and it has been for thousands of years it's only you know in a short modern period where we've had a lot more emotion around that topic and we always would look at that kind of subject and try to draw darkness out of it and try to say like oh something horrible going on here it's not necessarily the case and it hasn't necessarily been the case for thousands of years i just think that you know we like to find problems so that we because we don't feel good about ourselves so we try to find problems with the world sometimes just so that we can say to other people like oh look we're such good people it's sad but anyway i don't know anything about the story of this painting or of this goddess really i read a little bit of the wikipedia article but i don't know much about it i'll say that of all the creatures i would choose to pull my chariot two cats are probably last on the list if they're anything like my cat, I'm pretty sure that one of them would just stop and clean itself while the other one runs in some opposite direction and then just takes a nap. Anyway, also I'm noticing here she has this stick with runes written on it. I don't know what those runes say. I'd be interested to know if you know anything about it. So the first thing I want to talk about is the paint handling. And I think the paint handling here is extraordinary. It is extremely well done and masterful paint handling. I'm not seeing anything that I would consider to be any kind of mistake or distraction or anything like that. A personal preference for me is a certain thickness of paint so that the texture of the canvas isn't impeding upon the reading of the work or isn't impeding upon my immersion into that world. And I think that this paint handling is just how I like it personally. It's This painting obviously to me has a strong neoclassical influence. It looks like something straight out of David's studio. But that said, it shows a subject which is from Norse mythology, which is kind of an interesting blend of those two worlds. Anyway, these, some of these figures look very Renaissance to me. This one in particular looks like a Michelangelo. This looks very Renaissance to me. This also looks like someone who studied the Sistine Chapel at least, one of the mottos of the neoclassical movement, art movement, was never let your brushwork show. Interesting little side fact, there are plenty of neoclassical paintings that do have brushwork in them, so it's not exactly something, it was a, not exactly a hard and fast rule, but it was a rule that was kind of generally adopted, and this painting seems to adopt that as well, and that's okay. Personally, my preference is for brushwork that has a little more vivacity, like I love John Singer Sargent and his brushwork, people like that. But I have no problem with the brushwork here, or the lack of brushwork, I guess you could say. The paint application is done without making use of the possible benefits that brushwork can bring to the painting. That's okay, there's no obligation to use that. And like I said, I think the paint handling here is fantastic. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the color. Now, the first thing I've noticed was that this painting has a sort of yellow cast to everything, which is fine. And I'm going to say that old oil paintings, as they age, become more yellow. All of them do. It's just how it goes. That's how linseed oil oxidizes. 
and varnishes change color over time. That's just how it is. So this painting could be yellowing due to that, or it could be that it just kind of has a yellow cast to it, a sort of warm glow yellow light. And that would be in line with how oil paintings used to be made for a long time as well. You didn't really see too many instances of cool light in oil paintings for hundreds of years. If you kind of, you'll notice that if you kind of go to a museum and you squint your eyes and you sort of look around painting galleries, you'll see a, lot, an, a huge emphasis on brown, very little emphasis on blue. I kind of wonder if that's part of the reason why Picasso's blue period <laughs> seemed to appeal to people so much. It was just using this newer blue pigment that was cheaper in a way that you didn't see artists do before because before that the paint was very expensive. Lapis blue paint was very expensive. It was the most expensive pigment. I wouldn't be surprised if there was none in this entire painting or just tiny touches here and there for like eyes or something. So anyway, given those things to talk about regarding yellowing and warm uh, yellowing color, warm tones and light being a predominant trend, blue cooler colors being expensive, all that stuff, if all that wasn't a factor, there's something that I personally think would benefit this painting, and that would be if it had a, can, a kind of counterpoint to this yellow light somewhere. Like for instance, perhaps down here, there, if there was like a cool light that was reflected back on these figures, down here perhaps, or even just down here, there was kind of a cooler tone to counterpoint that it wouldn't even necessarily have to be reflected on her face. Uh, just something to kind of offer a counterpoint to the warm light, thereby making that the effect of that warmth stronger. That's just me personally. I don't know what you, what do you think about that? Let me know in the comments. And something else that I really want to talk about is the pose. But before I do that, I hope that you will check out my store on Society6 in the link below. I've got this image there on products that you can purchase. I've also got all kinds of other images there that you can buy on t-shirts, mugs, stickers, iPhone cases, prints, all that stuff, all kinds of other stuff. Christmas is coming, so I'm sure you have something that you need to purchase for somebody who enjoys fantasy art as much as you do. Anyway, like I said, it's in the link below. I hope that you will check it out. Okay, now back to this painting. So there's something I wanna talk about with the pose, and I feel the same way about the pose as I do about the paint handling, about the brushwork, or a, a lack of something there that there's no obligation to do that. And that is that she's standing in a very kind of, um, I wouldn't say it's bland, but it's not particularly expressive. Her face is not particularly expressive. And I think that that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that there might have been some kind of opportunity to do something different, but there's no obligation, especially because there's nothing going on in the scene that would justify or necessitate her having some kind of extreme emotion or some extreme pose. And I'm noticing that even these kids, there's a kind of a stiffness to the pose, to the poses, and even in an attempt to make something more dynamic here, like for instance here or here, it just has, you know, the stiffness that old oil paintings appear generally to have for the most part. Most of them throughout the history of art have a kind of lack of movement, shall we say. That is in part due to the difficulty of making oil paintings. I suspect that this painting was done in the traditional way at the time. That is, you had a model, you sat her down, you made drawings of her, you made probably a preliminary painting of her, you had her sitting on a stage perhaps, you had her lit, but you had a long process involved in creating this image. So you had a person here, a young lady, who had to sit still for a long period of time. If she was smiling or doing something very expressive, that tends to look very stiff and weird. It takes, I think, a highly skilled artist to make a figure that looks very representational also look very expressive in the days before photography. So that said, I can just imagine that this young lady was sitting on some kind of chair or something like that. And while here there's a kid holding up her arm, I'm pretty sure that in the studio there was some kind of box or something like that holding up her arm there. And that's fine. And I think that this artist really worked with that limitation of image creation at the time to make a very nice painting. Also, I'm gonna say that he seemed to avoid a mistake that other artists who had the same limitations have not avoided. Like for instance, here is a painting by Bougereau. Now Bougereau is an artist that I feel very mixed about. <laughs> there are things that I absolutely love about his work, love it. 
and there are things that I do not like at all about his work. And then, and then there's a mix for most of the other ones. You probably love Bougereau. I think most people really love his work. And this painting has a lot of virtues. There's a lot of really nice things about it, but it has one thing that I consider to be a mistake. And that is the, I guess you could say the integration of this figure into the scene. And that results from the painting process at the time. And here's what I mean. So you'll notice that she's standing, or I'm sorry, laying down on this flat plane of sand. However, under her hands here are these sort of angled lumps of the ground. Now, why is it? Why isn't there any kind of like angled lumps over here or over here or something like that? And I suspect, as many art historians have done in the past, I'm not the first one to point this out, that it was a model sitting on a table like this. And the artist just kind of worked with the pose that he had. He wasn't the artist to take her fingers and create from his imagination fingers going out this way or here going out this way. That, he, that wasn't Bougereau the man. He wasn't going to do that. He was going to take what he was given from nature and work with it. And that's what he did. He came up with a justification for why her fingers are pointed down that, to me, looks a little weird. So it's a weakness. It's a weakness of the painting, in my opinion. It takes away the immersion. It's like seeing the strings on the puppet. But, you know, I'm not saying it's an enormous deal. I'm just saying it's a little bit of a deal if you really want to review artworks like I do. It kind of reminds me of this. So this is a Roman sculpture, and it has this little support here. And you, as a viewer, are just sort of asked to look past that. That is, a, that is there for a physical reason. It helps support this arm that would have broken off. I guess it did break off anyway, but it w during the, you know, when the arm was still there, the artist thought that the weight was too much and that it was gonna break, so he put this support here. It's kind of a weakness that you just can't really get around that often, and that's just the way it was. So that said, given those limitations or given that process of creating this image, I think that this artist worked with it very well, and I don't think he made the mistake that Bougereau made. I think that he integrated it into the scene just fine, which is a really nice thing. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is composition, and I'm going to talk about something that's extremely simple, and I think every artist who sees this would say, okay, that's really obvious. You don't have to point that out to me. Why are you going so in-depth in this extremely, extremely simple little topic? And that is about this edge in the background here. I'm noticing that this edge is a t being used as a tool to enhance something about the image. It's a tool that many artists have used for hundreds of years. And the idea is that when you have a sort of line like this behind the subjects, it helps them to stand out. It helps increase your reading of them as dimensional. It helps further convince you that what you're looking at, and remember, when this was made, there was no photography. There were no, I mean, I guess there was a little bit of beginning of photography, but the intention was that you see this in person. There was never the intention that you'd go, that you'd be seeing this on a tablet or in a book or anything like that. You'd be seeing it in person. So you'd know, because you have two eyes, you'd know that it's a flat plane. It's a flat canvas. But there was, through artistry and through skill, you are tricked in a way, or you are given another reading of the information in front of you, and that is that it's a, it is simultaneously a spatial scene. So you read it as both uh, a spatial scene and as a flat plane, and that this line in the back increases your reading of it as a spatial scene. So I'm not satisfied to just look at that and say, okay, that's the way it is. I'm not satisfied to accept rules. I don't like something because it is a rule. I like a rule when it explains an effect because I don't think anyone goes in front of a painting and says, well, I like this because the rule tells me I have to like this or because the rule is good. They say, I like this because I'm experiencing an a certain effect. So here is a Michelangelo painting that uses the same thing. Like I said, this is an old technique. You increase the reading of the figures as dimensional or the scene as spatial by putting some kind of horizontal or any any kind of continuous element behind them. And I'm just going to also say that this painting is so awesome. Look at that figure. It's so well rendered. It is such a shame that this is Michelangelo's only oil painting. What a world of great art we would have if he had a different view of that. Anyway, so let me kind of explain what I mean. Here are some shapes. You could say this is a shape. 
this is a shape, this is a shape, and that they all are just laying together flat on a plane. However, when you go some, when you manipulate it and you put it like this, you might read it differently. You might read this as uh, a bar or some kind of object with something behind it. So you're reading it now as spatial. And why is that? That to me is very interesting. I wanna dig deeper. I wanna understand how the mind works as an artist because I wanna use that information in the creation of my work. So why is that the case that you're reading that as spatial? And the best summary of that process that I've come across yet is from an, a, a gestalt psychologist named Rudolf Arnheim. And he said that your brain, that your mind wants to perceive the data in as simple a manner as the conditions allow. So your brain wants to see it as simple as it possibly can. So it's more simple to view this as a horizontal line behind a bar than it is to view this as a shape, this as a shape, this as a shape, and all these as distinct shapes with no connection spatially to, between them. So to me, that's extremely interesting. That explains why you don't read this shape as something like this, and instead you read it as objects in the front with another shape in the back. So you don't just say, well, I just trust it, or I just, um, I just do this because other artists have done it. Now you can say, well, I want to achieve this effect or I don't want to achieve this effect. Okay, that's all I have to say about this painting. I hope that you enjoyed that. I hope that you will comment. Let me know what you think. Did you like it? Did you not like it? And um, that's all. Take care. Bye.